I'd like this to be as casual as possible, so any point along the line, as long as we're not running too late, please feel free to ask questions. Um, when Donnie first started here, we got going along fairly well. She came to the conclusion that I was the face and she was the brains. <laughs> it's kind of sad on the face part, but you know, we can be sure on the brains part. So if you ask questions, ask her, not me. Okay? I'm, just, I'm just a face up here. Um, I first went to Shanghai in 1984. Uh, how many of you have been, have been to Shanghai? Probably many of you have been before I. Look at that, almost everybody. I understand Sally Kirby did a talk this morning. Maybe she could come up and take over for me. No, okay. Um, the idea for this exhibition started really when we were working on the Ming exhibition, and the Shanghai Museum lent to this show, to that show, to the Ming show. They lent a number of paintings. And I was in Shanghai uh, working on those loans and having tea with Zhou Yuanchen, who's the head of the Foreign Affairs Office. And she said, geez, if you're doing this show for Beijing for the Olympics, you know, San Francisco and Shanghai had this long-term sister city relationship, you better do something for us for our expo. So we started talking about it and started thinking about it at that time. And um, exhibition evolved o over time. The first idea, of course, is to do something from the Shanghai Museum collection and, and just borrow some other great treasures. Uh, we've done that before. It was done here in 1982, and it also turned out that the British Museum was doing something along those lines. To pick something a little uh, tight, a little more focused, maybe doing something like Shanghai Modern, but Shanghai Modern had been done as well. So um, kind of ran down a whole series of different kinds of themes and topics that could be approached and kind of settled on Shanghai visual culture, a little bit about what visual culture in Shanghai is all about. So I went back then to Zhou Yuanchen a number of, a couple of years, a year later, and started that conversation. And that material really isn't in the Shanghai Museum collection. They have some, they have Shanghai School paintings, and some, a few oil paintings, but they don't have much of the other kinds of things that we were thinking about. So they were our partner on this project, and they arranged loans from the Shanghai Art Museum, which does modern and contemporary, uh, Lushan Memorial Hall, which does kind of revolution, mater revolution material, things related to Lushan and the revolution in Shanghai. The Shanghai City Museum, which does things on the, kind of the history of Shanghai, has photograph, Chi Hao, and a lot of the graphic arts that you're going to see here. And then, for the first time in my career, they arranged loans for private collections in Shanghai. And that was a new experience for everybody, particularly the Ministry of Culture in Beijing. They had a fit. They didn't know what to do about sending things from private collections in China to a museum exhibition in the United States. Doing institution to institution loans is pretty straightforward, but doing loans from private collections in China uh, is still giving us a little bit of hiccups along the way. We also uh, put Britta Erickson in charge of doing the contemporary section for us. So Britta has selected a number of things on uh, living artists. And uh, we have some pieces that the acrylic is still drying. And you see those as, as they come along. So the pieces in the exhibition date really from the earliest piece in the exhibition is 1849. And the latest one, well, there's a, a painting that's 2009. But of course, the installation pieces will be 2010. They'll be brand new uh, when we open the show. So let's start then with some of the images that we're looking at. We've changed the way we will be looking at the whole building in order to make this work. Let's see if we can get a, can we get a cursor on there, or do you want to use the, use the point? Okay. So coming in as you normally do through the entrance, uh, rather than going into the north court, uh, we're going to come into the south court. Sorry, we're going to come in this way, come into the south court, We'll have a big panel kind of announcing the exhibition here on the wall at the end of uh, South Court. Everybody's kind of following that. This is going to be important for your tours because you're going to come in, the tours are going to be meeting here. You're going to see an image with an arrow that's going to drive you down Hammond Arcade. And then the exhibition will begin in Osher. And you will not be able to go out this door. You'll go around Osher, back out, through, out, out of Osher, into Hambrick, through, down through Hambrick, out of Hambrick, into Lee, uh, the Education Resource Room has, nice, has generously given up their space, and we'll have that for video arts. We'll have video art there. And they'll finish out with a number of installation pieces in North Court. Any questions on that? It's a pretty straightforward layout. It's actually the recommended route that was given to us uh, when we first did our studies about how to make this building work. And hopefully, hopefully it will work. 
Oh, Donnie did this fancy thing, huh? <laughs> I couldn't do that either. Not only is she the brain, she's technically competent, but I'm not. We will actually have a piece installed in the Hammond Arcade. Uh, this is a piece called Shadow in the Water by Liu Jianhua, one of the uh, installation, and uh, he does works in ceramic, mainly having piece, pieces cast at Jing De Jun. So this is a series of panels, or six of these that are put together. And what it represents are uh, kind of important buildings throughout China. It's not, a, a, it's not when I first thought of, oh cool, this is the skyline of Pudong, but it's not. These are famous buildings from all over China, and they're all put together, and he's making a comment on modern architecture in Shanghai, contemporary architecture throughout China, all beginning to look the same. So he's, he's making a comment, a comment about Shanghai and its role, and China and its role in an international, an international community. <laughs> so, uh, Shanghai, the introductory panel will be on the outside as you're coming into um, Osher Gallery, and that's where you get the kind of the background of the exhibition. And then you go on into, into uh, Osher, and we have beginnings. Now, we've divided the exhibition into four parts. So, there's beginnings, there's high times, there's revolution, and there's Shanghai today. So, that's, that's pretty straightforward but they're not necessarily exactly chronological. You'll see that revolution in particular overlaps quite a bit with high times, and we'll explain the reason for that as we, as we come to it. One of the things that I learned working on this project is a lot of those kinds of myths about Shanghai are wrong. Um, there's a lot about Shanghai that one accepts as kind of a, as, as a general idea, um, General, general information, correct information, or factual information that are just flat wrong. And one of them that Donnie and I worked, have been working hard on to dispel is that uh, at the beginnings, uh, when Shanghai became a treaty port in 1842 after China lost the uh, opium wars with the British, but there wasn't much there. It was a little village. It's kind of a little village and, the, and mud flats. It's kind of what the, the standard description of Shanghai is at that time. Uh, people who have done studies on demographics give us a figure of 400,000 people in Shanghai in 1840, uh, before the Opium Wars. That's not a little village. That's a fairly major city. There was a big walled city with a lot of people in it there. So Shanghai wasn't a little muddy village, uh, a little mi village of mud flats when the British showed up. But it was attractive to the British because of its, uh, it's at the bottom end of the Yangtze River, a lot of wealth around there, uh, direct access to transportation up and down the Yangtze uh, and to a large part of the populations of China. It's not so far from Jing Dejun, it's not so far from any number of areas where trade was going on, the silk production centers in Suzhou and so on. So it was, it was attractive to the British because it was a port, a good port, uh, with the Huangpu River and all, and they had access to a major wealthy part of China. So it was one of the five treaty ports that they, they sought out. So the, the Opium Wars ended in 1842, and the Treaty of Nanjing was signed in that year. The British didn't get there until 1843, so you're going to see different dates, and I've already been questioned about that. Did Shanghai really start as a treaty port in 1842 or 1843? Well, a little bit of both. The treaty was signed in 1842, the British began to settle there in 1843. Okay, let's go on to the next one. We, uh, as I started this project out and was in these conversations with Joey and Chen, I found out that Nancy Berliner, who's the curator of Chinese art at the Peabody Essex Museum in uh, Salem, Massachusetts, was also working on a project about Shanghai. And what she was interested in doing was recreations of the rooms of famous Shanghai residents. So she wanted to do a room of Sun Yat-sen. She wanted to do a room of Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. These kind of important people who had spent times in in, uh, in Shanghai, but uh, we realized that there couldn't be two projects going on, and we didn't want to compete. So we combined our efforts, and Nancy uh, will be here to speak to you, I hope, sometime along in the in the run of this exhibition because she's brilliant, uh, absolutely wonderful person to work with, and we kind of put these lists together, the two of us, as we went back and forth. One thing that, that g gave us access to was a marvelous group of what are called China trade paintings, which are in the collection of the Peabody Essay. So these all came from Salem, Massachusetts. And we have five of them, and they show you early views of the bond, uh, where the traders settled when they first came to, to Shanghai in the 1840s. And the earliest of them is actually dated 1849, and this one's a little bit, a little bit later than that. But they do give you changing views of Shanghai and the Shanghai bond. 
And as you look around and see some of the things that we've listed as uh, articles to read in, in, in our bibliography, there are, uh, there's an article by a man named Pulitzer who, talk, who actually does kind of a, a changing of the views of the Bund by using these paintings. And you can date the buildings in the Bund uh, in these paintings. You can date the paintings by the changing in the buildings that they depict. But if we go back and forth between these two, let's go back to that one first. What do you see as a major difference between, say, this painting and the next one? What have we got going? Let me see. Here we go. What have we got right here? Steamboats, huh? Paddle ships, steam navigation. So as we get into the around 1860, you know, steam navigation uh, becomes more and more common. And that's an important part, factor in Shanghai. Why would that be important? All right, we got too many people out there. So, okay, but a raised hand. Okay, please. Okay, you can go up river, and you can. A lot of things about steam navigation. When you were going by a clipper ship, and you know, the ship going from the east coast were mainly clipper ships, you had to go with the prevailing winds. You could go certain times of the year. Other times of the year, if you're going against the prevailing winds, you couldn't get there. Uh, it also has to do with tides. You're going to go up against the tide with a wind powered boat. You're going to have problems getting there. It represents a lot of things. So having, having steam sh steamships, having those kind of boats there meant, meant a lot. It meant that international transport was much freer and the movement back and forth between uh, uh, Europe, between the United States uh, and China, and Shanghai in particular, increased dramatically. San Francisco played a big role in that. Do you all know that? Pacific, Pacific Steam Mail started doing uh, runs from here in 1860 and 1868, or so, 1867, 1868. And that became even more important when the Transcontinental Railroad was finished in 1869. San Francisco basically became the point of departure to go to East Asia, so uh, Hong Kong, Yokohama, and Shanghai. And that was important for San Francisco when the city was basically destroyed in 1906. Well, there was that whole kind of link between the Bay Area and China. That was one of the reasons that San Francisco was able to reconstruct. There was a business here that was based on trading with, uh, with East Asia. Pacific Steam became, Dollar Lines became, American uh, President's Line, and that's still, that's still in existence. So that old company has been around a long, long time. So steam navigation is one thing that we see as beginning to change, and that kind of freedom of movement of materials back and forth between the West and between that and China. Also, what's, what is that? What is that? See that big boat, that big boat right there? There's another one over here. You guys, you know what those are? Opium pulse. So opium was illegal, and of course that's what caused the whole battle with the, the British and the British force, the Chinese to import opium, and that was the basis of the treaty ports, and a lot of money was made in Shanghai trading opium for silk and tea and, and so on. Um, until, the 18, until 1860, uh, opium was still outlawed, but by 1860 it was legal, and in 1860, these opium boats, which had been kind of tucked away in the corner somewhere else, were actually pulled into the harbor right in front of Shanghai, and there they are. So that's where you traded for your opium, it's right there in front of everybody. So these paintings give us a really good and interesting history of, of early Shanghai. Some of the major trading companies early on were from the East Coast. So this is our earliest painting. This is 1849. These paintings were created by Chinese artists, probably trained in Canton. Why would they have been trained in Canton? Okay, so Canton, Guangdong had been the major trading point, uh, trading port, point of entree the legal place for people to trade in, in China prior to the, the treaty ports. So that had been from the, from the 1600s on, 1500s on, had been the place where Westerners had come and done their trading. And it was there that uh, a lot of Western influence entered, entered China and where there were whole schools of Western influence paintings of one sort or another, including these China, so-called China trade paintings. There were a lot of them there. Uh, and most of the artists would have been trained there. The main artist uh, working in Shanghai is a man named Chao Hua, and you'll see these names uh, in the uh, catalog, so you can pick up on those. Don't know too much about him, and we don't know what, what Chao Hua means. Obviously, it's not Mandarin, it's not Shanghai dialect, but it's something, and, and there he is. He painted many of these. 
they were really quite skilled in oil, in oil painting. Uh, they were working almost exclusively for a Western clientele, so they were working for those traders and raiders that were living there along the Bund. Uh, but they were Chinese artists. So there's an interesting kind of relationship between Chinese painters and Western patrons. Same is true with silver. Silver was one of the means of exchange. The, the Westerners brought silver to China, uh, but it wasn't enough, so they brought opium as well. But there was a point in time, uh, quite a long period of time, when it was cheaper to bring silver from raw silver from the United States or from Europe and have the pieces created in whatever style in China and then ship them back. Uh, the labor was so good in China. They were able to recreate almost anything that could be done in the West. It was so good and so inexpensive that you could actually ship it there in a raw form, get it created and ship it back, and it would be cheaper than having something created in Europe. So that continues today, doesn't it? I think we've had that issue with Japan and with China as well. So uh, much to everybody should win. There were a number of uh, silver shops in, in, uh, in Shanghai. And there's actually a collector of this material, a um, um, man named Stephen Potash, who lives over in Oakland. He collects things related to the Pacific, Pacific Steamship Company, the mail, mail company of steamships, and also this export silver. So we were able to borrow these from him. We have two pieces from him, from his collection. So as you uh, continue in the beginning section, the next text panel, didactic panel, that the visitors would encounter is called the Chinese in Shanghai. And this is a great place to introduce to the visitors one of our sub-themes of the exhibition. So not only do we have the overriding sort of chronological of beginnings, high times revolution in Shanghai today, but one of the other major sub-themes running through the entire exhibition is the, looking at the different personalities throughout the history of Shanghai's visual culture. And so for this upcoming section, we have um, paintings and illustrations and posters of eminent Chinese residents of um, Shanghai from 1850 to 1911. And also not only do we have portraits of these people, but also the fact that they were made by um, professional artists living in Shanghai. They themselves were also a character, a personality that um, would be fun to uh, talk about. And so the Chinese population in Shanghai, um, we, they were due to many factors, political, economic, both inside China and outside of China. For example, domestically, the Taiping Rebellion, which was one of the major um, upheavals that led many from surrounding Shanghai to flee into Shanghai. And so the population boomed. And so this created um, you know, a larger labor force, but also a larger market for these artists. And so, now when we're looking at the Chinese population in Shanghai, there, may, there are a few categories we can put them into. One would be, for example, this gentleman depicted here. His name is Wu Dacheng, also known as Ke Chai. He belongs to a group of the more traditionally educated elite that have been um, of the higher classes throughout traditional China. He was, he passed the civil service examinations, he served in the Qing bureaucracy as a governor of Guangzhou and Hunan provinces, but he was best known as um, a student of Chinese art, of studying Chinese art, but he was also a seal carver, a calligrapher, and judging by this hand scroll, he was also a major collector of ritual bronze vessels, especially of the Bronze Age. And the interesting thing is, we learned that if you, s actually, we learned that we actually have a vessel that is depicted in this detail of this um, hand scroll. And then also, later on in the hand scroll, he has a survey of rubbings of his different vessels in his collection. 
and we believe, due to its shape and the fact that we have the same 16 character inscription, that it was most likely the same piece because later his collection was dispersed and we believe one of it came to, our, to the museum. Now, continuing to look at the imminent Chinese population, uh, we have two portraits here. On your left, the portrait of Feng Gengshan, and on your right, the portrait of Wu Qingyun or Wu Changshuo. Now, uh, these men, along with the artists who painted these portraits, Ren Yi and Ni Tian, they all seem, do, based on historical records, they seem to have been part of the same artist circles. And so one of the uh, characteristics of what Michael will later discuss about the Shanghai School of Painting is that it seems like everybody knew everybody. And that's how ideas were exchanged, that's how art was made and sold and passed along, because they all helped each other out in this um, close-knit community. Now, another category of um, the Chinese population during this time are these groups of individuals whom we now call compradors, and they were Chinese who were representing the interests of foreign residents. And so, in a way, you can consider them the rising middle class. Uh, they were educated, they could most likely speak another foreign language, such as English or French, and they had the buying power to purchase some of the more advanced technologies, and they also had probably the leisure time to enjoy the more um, popular forms of entertainment that were um, in vogue in Europe, for example, such as on your right, this picture of women playing a game of billiards. Now, billiards, or the form of billiards that was being played at that time in um, the UK was snooker, which was well established in 1887 in England. But yet we already see a, an illustration here in Shanghai at roughly the same time, give or take a few years, of billiards being offered in one of the amusement parks in the city. And then with the illustration on your left, you get an indication of electricity in Shanghai. Now, Thomas Edison in New York City had first powered electricity from um, the plant in September of 1882. And mere months afterwards, electricity was installed in public streets and public spaces in Shanghai. And so, in terms of technology advancing, we can't say that, oh, Shanghai just, Shanghai followed technological advances. It was more that Shanghai kept a pace. Shanghai was also on the vanguard of these um, advancements. Yes? Comprador. Comprador. Yes. It's, it's, <clears throat> it's Portuguese. <laughs> it's so one of the things that, that has continued to puzzle me is I, as I work with Shanghai. Um, you know, there, there were the, the end of the 19th century in, in China was pretty dreadful. Um, when I was in graduate school, one of my fellow Chinese language students was a, worked in and demographics and demog a demographer, population specialist. And her conclusion was that China reached maximum population saturation in about 1850 at about 400 million. And that it went beyond that. And as it went beyond that, um, the natural thing happened. People began to die. And there were famines, and there were uh, there was unrest to go with that. And in the last decades of the 19th century, some 30 million people died uh, from famine and uh, disease, and nearly 10 percent of the population. That's still an 
probably the highest number of people who, to have died in that nature in world history. A little disconcerting if you think that they were coming, if you, you believe in the bell curve on oil and we're coming to the end of that again and now Chinese population is over, well over a billion or whatever, whatever it is. Um, but what happened, of course, is there were revolts and problems everywhere and the Taipings uh, really messed up, tore up the lower part of the Yangtze River, uh, Yangtze River Basin. Um, they took over the city of Nanjing and there were Refu and Suzhou in the other place else. Shanghai yeah, had his own little issue with that, the small sword rebellion. Um, but basically, because of the foreign forces that were there, um, it survived. And Chinese fled there in great numbers. And sophisticated people like Wu Chuang Shua and any number of others, Zhao Zhichen and many, any other number of others, came there uh, to seek refuge from the, the turmoil going about. So you have all of these very high class intellectual people coming in and settling in Shanghai. What language is spoken in Shanghai today? Shanghai dialect. Shanghai dialect is based on the 400,000 people who lived there in 1840, not the language of those people who came in 1890. So there's a core in Shanghai that was, has always been there. Uh, and there's a toughness and resilience in the people that dwell in Shanghai. But I think it's one of the characteristics that you can see that goes throughout the history of that city through the period of this exhibition that we're looking at. There's a kind of toughness and resilience. So look at Shanghai as Sin City, look at Shanghai as whatever, however you want to see it. But underneath it all, there's a toughness, ability to survive, ability to come back and overcome adversity, which is remarkable. Not only overcome, but thrive in adversity. And that's one of the things that, as I went through the process of working on this exhibition, really came to light for me. What makes Shanghai unique? What is the character of the city that makes it different from other cities in, in uh, China. Is it because the, because the foreigners were there? That has something to do with it, certainly. But more than that, um, the foreigners were there in cities in China that had foreign occupants, often were kind of suppressed. Shanghai wasn't suppressed. They competed. The Shanghaiese competed with the, with the foreigners. Uh, they made money off of them. They took the money and bought great bronzes and made great collections. Uh, they took their systems and turned them into their own. And that's the case of the Shanghai School, where they begin to set up fan shops and to sell paintings and to have ateliers and to work in a very commercial fashion uh, that's very different, of course, than the literati tradition that had existed in China prior to that time. So the artists who came to Shanghai found a, a nature in that city, a personality in that city, uh, that, they, that they continued to support and, and go with. And the Shanghai School is a pretty good example of that. Just a couple of examples. Uh, let's look at the painting on the left, Morning Rising Over the Sea, dated 1891 by Wu Qingyun. What would you say about that painting as you look at it? Where are the, what are the stylistic factors that this is based on? What, what was this artist looking at? So two things, we see a little bit of a sense of perspective, right? If you're gonna see some, quite a bit of distance and we probably have a horizon line there and the sun rising over that. Um, where did that have come from? One of the important things about the Shanghai School is a very close relationship between China and Japan. Uh, Japan had opened to the West in 1868 and started to open even earlier than that, but had been forced to open in 1868 and really embraced the, re the West from that point on. And Japan became that kind of filter through which much of the, the what many Western styles came to China. And that's certainly the case here. We have a, a Chinese artist uh, seeking kind of Western stylistic factors, putting them in his painting, but through Japanese, through Japanese eyes. He really, somebody, he had seen Japanese painting and studied in Japan. The painting on the right, uh, we just saw the image, uh, a portrait of this guy. This is Wu Chong Shuo, um, Red Plum Blossoms, dated 1916. So a man who was wealthy and active uh, throughout the 19th and into the early 20th century in Shanghai. And this is a Shanghai school painting at its prime. And these bright colored, big, bold, splashy ink, uh, something very different than what would have been considered appropriate by the literati artists of an earlier generation. Calligraphy. Uh, 19th century, late 19th century in China was one of the great er eras for innovation in Chinese calligraphy. And Shanghai was the center for that, and uh, the Shanghai School really was one of the major, major uh, areas where this happened. These are two uh, 
two pairs of calligraphies by Zhao Zhiqian, uh, one of the great calligraphers of uh, the Shanghai School. What would you say about them? Those of you who have suffered with me doing my, my experimentations in calligraphy and trying to present calligraphy. Yeah, one is in steel script and one is in clerical script. So they're based on ancient scripts. And there is this kind of division in, in Shanghai between those who see innovation and change needing to be based on things coming from the West and those who see innovation and change based on things found in ancient China. And Zhao Zhiqian uh, certainly was one of those who sought uh, his kind of inspiration in ancient China. And he really did make major changes in the way Chinese calligraphy was practiced by studying things that came, he studied the actual objects, the bronzes and the steely uh, of those earlier periods and based his styles on those. And Donnie uh, referenced a little bit about these artistic groups. And there were a lot of them, these kind of societies. Uh, and the societies would set up places where they would sell fans or sell works of art or support each other uh, one way or another. Art societies of different kinds. And that was certainly a foundation of the, uh, the Shanghai School. Uh, Shu Gu is one of the great artists of the, the Shanghai School. And we're really lucky to have this large album uh, by him in this, in this exhibition. Oh, we're starting High Times. So High Times has caused us some problems. Well, we use this title, we're, you know, as, as Nancy and I were running through these things and we're looking at the, the various titles that we could use, High Times seemed just right from a Western perspective about how you how we look at kind of 1910 to 1940-ish uh, in Shanghai, that's High Times. There was money, there was, people were having a good time with High Times in Shanghai. When we translated that into Chinese, it caused all kinds of consternation in Shanghai because they want the highest time in Shanghai to be right now, not back there in the past. So they weren't pleased with this at all. We stuck with it um, in English, but we've used something different in uh, Chinese. We've used high times in Chinese. So high times kind of 1912 to, uh, we, we pick it up in 1949, though really the high times in, Ch in Shanghai began to end around in 1937 with the Japanese invasion. H-A-I-P, mm -hmm. right, So I'm confused. Good, good thing that Donnie is the brains here. Again, we, we, enter, we introduced this section uh, with a couple, with some major personalities. Uh, the, the image on the left is a portrait of Madame Kang Youwei. Kang Youwei was one of the great reformers of late, of late imperial China into the early part of the Republican, uh, Republic era of China and by the great Western style painter, uh, Xu Bei Hong. And we have one other work by Xu Bei Hong also in this exhibition oil work. Um, when I look at this, I say, wow, outside of the fact that, that she is clearly Chinese and in Chinese dress, this looks like it could be in Europe. And looking around and talking around and really talking with Forrest, he said, you know, you should look at this. This might be in a studio. And this might be the kind of thing that people were using as a, as a set for portraits done with a camera, which is, is likely. If you look at it, everything there is European. The setting, the, the table, the books on the table, um, all the architecture, just her. And that's the only person, the only thing here that is Chinese, and the artist. So the Chu Bei Hong is one of those uh, artists who very much influenced and studied and had a real desire to be, to take the West and make it uh, influence Chinese art from it. The other guys, the two guys on the other side, I find it interesting. One of the great reformers, but one of the great kind of classical Chinese uh, individuals is done in a Western style. Uh, but the other two, Wang Jinrong and Du Yishan, who knows who they are? Oh, well, we got at least one person back there. <laughs> okay, these are the heads of the Green Gang. Uh, so these are the major gangsters uh, in Shanghai. They took over the opium trade around 1919 when it became li illegal again and the British stopped uh, uh, importing opium into China and well, the Green Gang took over. Uh, but they ran a lot of businesses, both legitimate and not so legitimate in, in uh, Shanghai. And there we are, we have portraits of them. 
As a matter of fact, as we were looking at the exhibition, one of the things that the, the Shanghai History Museum offered to us was Duyashan's clothes. They got his estate. So we had the potential of it, having his suit and all kinds of things. But for those of you, for most of our audience who doesn't know who Duyashan was, well, it was just kind of a suit, didn't look like much. So we decided not to go that route. But we did take the portrait because it's kind of cool. So here we have, in a traditional Chinese landscape setting, two of the great gangsters of late 19th and early 20th century Shanghai. Still going, okay, artistic debates. Those of you who are following contemporary art in, in China uh, know that there's this great debate about, can you be contemporary and do ink? Mm -hmm. So, and then those on the side of ink would say, well, ink is just a medium. I can be as contemporary as anybody else while I'm doing ink. It's just a medium. Well, those kind of debates really started in Shanghai in the early part of the, of the 20th century, and even in the 19th century. There was this debate about whether, if you're going to reform Shanghai, and you're going to reform China, do you have to just kind of throw away everything that is Chinese and become Western? Uh, do you have to be international contemporary? Or can you still retain some semblance of being Chinese? Or can you be fully Chinese and be contemporary? And those artistic debates were, were very, very active and very heated uh, during the 20th century, during the high times. And they were heated between individuals, between different schools, between different kinds of, but they were also heated within the same individual. Uh, an artist like Liu Hai Su, who was trained in Paris and was a great artist, well, he did both of these. Uh, he did the oil painting, the image of the bun, and he also did the, the, the ink and colors on paper, uh, which is a more uh, traditional landscape. So this is a debate that's going on uh, between people and also internally. And I tell you, as we watch contemporary Chinese artists uh, begin to mature and evolve, they're having the same debates within themselves as well. Many of those artists who thought you had to be international, contemporary, to be contemporary, are now exploring their roots more and more deeply and becoming more and more influenced by things that are truly Chinese. Of course, there was a continuation of the Shanghai School well into it through, throughout this period, and we see here uh, another work, uh, the Talong Ye, which is on the left, uh, Plum Blossoms Under the Moon. This is his kind of, uh, these are what he did, this is what he was famous for. Meng Yue means the cold moon, so that's what he was famous for, these kind of moonlit paintings. But again, an artist that was influenced, by, we're not supposed to use that term, but an artist who was interested in things happening in Japan and studied things happening in Japan and incorporated elements from that uh, into his work. So you see some kinds of uh, stylistic references to contemporary works being done in Japan. Shoji Liu very much more along the lines of those bright uh, flower and bird and, and, and uh, paintings of the traditional Shanghai school. Lin Feng Mian, even more complicated, because Lin Feng Mian went to Paris, uh, studied there, and actually was shown in salon, uh, in the salons in Paris uh, during the 20s, and then back to, Shang back to Shanghai, and became, you know, went right back to his ink roots. But, let's see. You would never have seen anything like that, as far as I know, in the earlier Chinese painting. Uh, this is more along the lines of Modigliani than an ink, right? Uh, and then this uh, starts off looking like a traditional landscape in ink and, and so on, very wet ink. But if you look at it more, there's, there's a lot of spatial recession and there's kind of abstraction of things going on. So again, he's one of those who's having that artistic debate, but it's going on with himself. He's, he's working on, can I be contemporary? Can I use these things that I learned while studying in Paris and can I make them Chinese? And I think as much as anybody of this period, he was successful. Okay, I'm done. No, I'm not. Okay, I keep thinking I'm done. So one of the, another of the sub-themes that, there are sub-themes that, that we worked on very carefully, and I hope these help you as docents as you go through. Um, as we look at kind of the, the high times in Chinese art, we, and the artistic debates, that will run along this way in, in Osho. So you'll see the artistic debates. So you'll see ink down here and you'll see oil down here. But as a sub theme, going back and forth this way, you'll have developments in Chinese ink painting and Shanghai school painting from the 19th century 
in all the way through high time. So there's kind of a mini exhibition, if you will, right here, of ink painting in Shanghai from the 19th century into the into the 1940s. Is that kind of is that clear to you? And there are a number of those. We have three of those in this in this gallery. So there's a little sub theme. If you find that you have a group that's interested in ink painting, well, there's a sub theme right here of ink painting. And then there's a, a talk about you know artistic debates going along this way. And so, spatially, we, uh, you can take a little diversion now into this space here, the central nook. And uh, there's a text panel on popular representations of, uh, representations of women. Now, if you recall, in the beginning section, we had those uh, two ink and drawing illustrations of Chinese women playing billiards or um, you know, standing next to an electric street light. That was the first indication, at least in this exhibition, of using the female image to advertise the modern aspects of Shanghai society. Now, especially as we enter into the first half of the 20th century, uh, it seems like the image makers and the power players of um, Shanghai were focused on making everybody know that Shanghai is modern. And so one of the major um, themes that we're exploring in the exhibition is how were images of women utilized in advertising modernity in Shanghai? And so looking at what we had in the exhibition, uh, the image of what was called a modern woman in um, these Shanghai images came in different guises. Um, they were shown in the private sphere and also in the public sphere. So in, in a private setting, you would see images of um, a wife or images of a mother. Then in a more public sphere, such as the one on the left here, you'd see uh, more professional women. They could be dance hostesses, such as the one pictured here on the left, or um, they could be in, they could be shown going out shopping, so they are publicly seen outside of the home. Um, but then we, there is also this popular icon that has been called the modern girl icon. And this icon appeared actually not only in China, but it also appeared concurrently in the United States and in Europe and in Russia. And what these what the icon represents or what she embodied was um, a greater social freedom, more self-confidence, and more, and basically representing that she has more access into the public domain. And so on your left, you see gliding like celestial beings. And this is a representation of dance hosts or taxi dancers of the 1920s and 1930s. And uh, dance halls, or social dancing, was very popular beginning in the 1910s in the United States. And as dance halls sprang up there, dance halls also were opened and established in the city. And then there was a building boom. More halls were opened in the 1920s. However, only beginning in 1922 were these halls accepting Chinese clientele, but all along they've had um, Chinese musicians playing in the halls and they also employed these women. And what they do was, you know, if you're a patron, you come in the door, you buy a ticket at the door saying, oh, this ticket is good for one dance with one of these hostesses. And whenever you're ready, you can, cl you can claim your ticket and you can have a dance with one of these women. And they eventually became sort of like the advertising face of these individual dance halls. And there are a couple of famous ones for these different halls in the city. And on your left, you see um, an image of a vibrant, happy, youthful young woman. She's lounging seaside. Now, um, such images of youthful vitality were especially popular 
when the nationalist government launched a new life movement in 1934. And with this movement, they are looking back um, and trying, looking back into traditional Chinese society and trying to revive certain codes of conduct, certain moral codes that they believe could strengthen and could make better um, Chinese society. And so two things that they emphasized was physical fitness for both men and women, and then also regarding women especially, giving, um, having them take, a, take on a more traditional homemaker role. And so this one you see on the right represents the one emphasis on physical fitness. And physical fitness for her is not necessarily implied by the fact that she's actually doing something. Like there are other poses where she is standing next to a polo player sitting on horseback. So she's not the one riding the horse, but the fact that she's close enough to a physical activity that reflects upon her own vitality. And so I give these um, two examples to contrast with this, for example, this poster that we have, in which I did not choose this image. <laughs> <laughs> but this, among all the groups of posters that we have on display in this little session of gallery, this is the most explicitly sexual out of all of them. And we're not shying away from such images because um, one of the ideals, if you will, that were associated with the modern woman um, and the modern girl icon during this time was greater emphasis on her sexuality and more, and more focus on the lives of young women. And so we will be raising questions in the object label about, well, what does it mean? Does greater social freedom necessarily equate with greater sexual freedom? And scholars continue to debate on what such, what the modern icon what the modern woman icon really did represent. Now also in this section, uh, we have a group of five chipao dresses. And they are arranged in a chronological order in a way, where we have three from the 1920s and two from the 1930s. And we arrange them in such a way because um, based on current scholarship, and also based on um, examples that we have, there was a marked difference between the styles of those two decades. It seemed like um, in the 1920s, chi pao that were made in the 1920s were more, were square, more box-like, more like a column when you wear it. While in the 1930s, the fit, it became more fitted to the um, female curve. And so this change in style, along with change in sleeve length, change in hem length, and change in fit, these changes came about because of changes in, um, in society's rules for women. In the 1930s, women became more, or they were, had more access to the outside world, the public domain, and more women were uh, working in smaller clerical jobs and whatnot. And so there was a quote that I found in a magazine during that time where they said, well, in the 1930s, women were supposed to be women. The chi pao um, was more fitted because women were supposed to look like women. And so this encapsulated what uh, women were, what the ideal woman was considered to be in the 1930s versus just a decade earlier, where she was just beginning to be made more public. And so, however, um, you can look at the Chi Pao, the development of the Chi Pao, in a couple of different perspectives as well. Scholars are debating on, well, what are the other different, what are the different motivations for the change in Chi Pao styles? Um, some say, well, are they just following fashion that was coming out of Europe? Or 
Was it because there was, because the nationalist government in China, um, you know, they had change in policies, for example, with the New Life Movement? Or were they actually, were the female fashions following the male fashions? Now that, that this is an interesting um, path of research that I've just touched upon and it is definitely intriguing. So if you want to know more about that, I can certainly talk more about that, but for the sake of time, I won't go into that one here. But another um, perspective to look at when we look at the development of Chi Tao is also in the development of silk production, especially in Shanghai, where um, later in the, early in the uh, 1900s, silk production was a native industry, and it was a big industry along with the cotton industry. However, going towards the 19, late 1920s, 1930s, uh, Japanese silk was actually superior to Chinese silk, and so, especially the later Chitan, you're right, 1930s, was most likely a, China, a Japanese silk. And so those are the different ways you can look at the development of just these five Chitan dresses. Now, another form of media that um, popularized the ideals of the modern woman in China was through film. And so we will have a flat screen monitor right here on the, uh, next to this text panel where we'll show a loop of different film clips from the time of the period, from the 1920s, 1930s, and 1940. And more than the posters that you see hung on the wall here, the screen actresses embody the modern woman ideal. And so, they not only appeared in film, but they also were popular for uh, magazine covers, such as these popular style magazines, lifestyle magazines, The Young Companion on your left, and The Movie World magazine on your right. Now I haven't been able to identify the actress on the left cover, but the one on the right is uh, Ms. Jo Manhua. She was a popular actress in the 1940s. And so, uh, these lifestyle magazines, especially Yangyo, The Young Companion on the left, it has the longest print run for the Tro magazine in modern China. And its aim was to be a companion to, uh, the, to its readers, to introduce and to keep one up to date on the latest cultural happenings, not only in fashion, interior design, architecture, but also in um, Chinese painting and in industrial goods being sold, commercial goods being sold. Yes, you have a question. Oh. Um, we can just a second. <laughs> and yes, I think we are right here. And so, the a second uh, sub theme that we can look at is, I guess, horizontal or lateral this way, in which, if you recall, these are the illustrations that we first saw in the 1880s. Uh, women, the introducing the female image and advertising modern aspects. Chinese society in the late 1800s. And then here we see in the first half of the 1900s con th that trend continuing, using the female image to advertise a modern Shanghai. And so in the, in the illustrations in the 1880s, yes, we do see the women in bound feet. And this practice was banned after uh, the fall of the Qing. And so, in a way, you say that was the beginning of the pro beginning of progress for um, women's status in society, in Chinese society. And one way you can look at these advertising images of women in the 1920s and 30s, you can look at it as yes, now women are you know now society has progressed 
women have more access to, um, they're, they're, they can be out shopping, they can walk around the Bund in public on their own, um, they are now expected to be ideal hostesses, and they're also expected to be basically um, what we consider to be a modern woman nowadays. You know, she's able to not only keep a happy home, but also have a happy and a productive public life. So that's one way to look at it. But then another way to look at it is that the fact that you are using a female image for commercial gain. And also the those who are using these images were not necessarily women. The majority of them were male. The artists who painted the images of these women in the 1920s and 1930s, they were all male. And the female image was used to sell cigarettes, sell alcohol, sell sex. And so one of the major questions we ask are, well, are these modern women, were they simply male fantasies on paper? Or did they actually reflect what the artist saw in reality? That you have these more fashionably coiffed and dressed women out and about in the streets. And so that's one of the sub things that we wish to highlight here for our visitors. So the, 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 again, this is not one to be to be ducked, but it's not an easy one, and it's not it's not as cut and dried as one would like. Here's A, it's great. Or here's A, it's bad. And here's B, it's great. It's it's not that way, of course. Women in nineteen in in late Qing China, in traditional culture, you know, if you were strongly Confucian, you were expected to follow your husband in death. I mean, and you had bound feet, and and da 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 da. This was not a great thing. Uh, women were maybe one step above property, or maybe not even one step above property. Um, people who, scholars of women's issues, look at Shanghai as leading the way to where Chinese women begin to break out of that a little bit. But it isn't a, a great leap. It's kind of steps. And even, even in that progress, uh, many of the women, I mean, there are, there are figures about I an mean, enormous percentage of women in Shanghai were in the sex trade. And that's not good. Many of them were at the bottom end of that sex trade, and that would have been awful. So it's not cut and dry. It's not. It's not. You go from here to here, and uh, and it, it's it's to be talked about. It's not to be ducked. Please, be, be, but it isn't. It isn't cut and dry. There isn't. It isn't like this is great and this is bad or or whatever. It's just there. It is. It's an issue, and things are changing. Donnie's been dealing with that as sensitively as she can, but. It's not easy. It's not an easy question. Um, and you'll certainly get it. And you'll probably have some reactions from uh, members of your audience who are going to say, but isn't she a prostitute? Well, yeah. So what are we going to do with that? You know? I see any other question. I just want to uh, say something about the bound feet. You know, the Manchus, the Qing ruling class, none of the Manchu women have bound feet. Mm -hmm. OK, so, so by and large, I think the bound feet is uh, was limited to basically middle class Han Chinese. The very poor peasant women could not afford to have their feet down because they had to work. So it's a very, and it eased out in the 19, uh, in the 20th century slowly. I mean, some maybe 90 year old now would still have bound feet when they were young, but some. You know, so, I mean, it, it went out slowly. Go ahead. Oh, this is in the one on the left, the lady lounging, the woman lounging. Um, it, it has been interpreted in a couple of different ways. And one of the ways that I find the most convincing is that if you notice, she is lounging in front of um, the skyline of Nanjing Road, which is, which was a commercial hub for Shanghai. And so there are several, Im there are many images in which you have the modern woman. She is impeccably 
dress, and she is um, associated, she is physically close to something modern. And so to place her in front of the commercial hub of Shanghai, you're, ha you're, you're getting a three, a triangle association in a way, where you have the modern woman, you have the city of Shanghai, and you have modernity all linked together. And this tripartite association was prevalent in visual images during the 1920s and 1930s. And it actually led to a claim by a writer, a contemporary writer of that time, saying, well, Shanghai style is like a modern girl. Basically, she's modern, she's dashing, she's cosmopolitan, just like the city in which she lives. And so this is how I, this, I view her as selling this, selling modernity, selling the city as modern, and selling the woman as, well, you, you want to find a modern woman? Come to Shanghai. And so I'm presenting these two posters because not only um, were not only were images of the modern woman popular, but also images of points of interest in the city were also popular. And so you have the one on the left, an image of cross section of Nanjing Road, which depicts actually three of the big four department stores in Shanghai. And on your right, it's the Great World Entertainment Center and amusement hall. And both of these buildings were located on busy intersections in the city. And here's a fun little thing. We have on the right a 1925, basically almost a contemporary hand-tinted photograph of Nanjing Road. And then just to see a development, this is a photograph taken in 2009 of the same intersection. And as you can see, the two uh, central buildings remain somewhat the same, but yet you have a towering skyscraper in the background. And now Nanjing Road is a pedestrian-only street. And this gives us a glimpse of the architecture of the city as well, which we will later discuss. So we're going to run on late, and I know we need to get out of here, so we're going to need to speed up a little bit. But there are a lot of sub themes going on in, in the show, and uh, a couple of them that you need to be aware of. Um, many of the buildings that we've seen, um, the people who paid for them, who financed them, were Jewish. Uh, the Jews from Baghdad uh, were great, great sources of income. Uh, they were influential in uh, setting up the kind of environment in which uh, Kanye Wei and Xu Bei Hong develop their interest in Western art. That's the Hardoons, the Sassoons, the Kadoris, and such. Um, so there's, there are multiple sub-themes running through this exhibition. But uh, Western-style art uh, in Shanghai, of course, that's the continuation of this artistic debate going along this line. So let's look a little bit of that. Uh, and I'm going to run through these pretty quickly, because I think they're fairly, fairly direct. Uh, even amongst those uh, artists who went to Europe who were, who were influenced by, uh, who were interested in or were, were seeking out Western style influences in their art, there were differences there as well. Xu Bei Hong was very much interested in what was happening in the salons. Liu Hai Su was very interested in uh, Van Gogh, I mean the contemporary, what was happening in, in contemporary art in Europe. So even amongst the people who were looking at trying, at the artists who were trying to say we need to look at the West to modernize China, uh, they were looking at very different, uh, looking at the West through very different lenses and seeing very different things. So it's, it's just wonderful and complex and messy and there are no simple answers to any of this and that's what makes Shanghai so fascinating. So let's go on. We do have, uh, again, the modern woman. This is Bon Salon, a, a woman painter who was active in the 20s and 30s and 40s uh, all the way until the 80s. So she kind of vanished from the public eye uh, after the uh, Japanese uh, occupation. And she did these very much kind of uh, Clovis styles. So she continues again along in that, that looking at the very contemporary art of, uh, in, in, of Europe of the time. And then again, another one of those horizontal discussions is oil paintings and uh, Western style art. So we go from the China trade paintings uh, of the 1850s, 60s, 
to the very contemporary European style, as a kind of Van Gogh based uh, Leo Heisu of the 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s. So again, there's a sub theme on the far end of this. Going this way, you can talk about ink. Down here, there's a sub, little sub-exhibition on oil. Okay, let's, let's take a little break here, and we'll go across the, across the way um, in just a minute. So we're going to be stuck in here forever if we don't hurry up a little bit. I'm sorry, we're having fun. But can you be back in, on, in your seats by a quarter of, please? <laughs> 